Greetings class, this is your teacher Brian Jump. In this video I'm going to go over the lecture called The Devices and the Voices, which covers jazz timbre, jazz instrumentation, and jazz theory. Okay, let's get started. That word timbre refers to the quality of a sound, which is to say its texture or personality or character, anything that distinguishes it from every other sound on earth. When somebody calls you on the telephone, you know that it's this person and not that person due to the timbre of their voice. So oftentimes we use adjectives to describe the timbre of a sound. A siren wail is shrill. The jazz guitar is dull. Right? The upright bass is full. Right? The oboe is reedy. And these words describe the specific characteristic or personality of a sound. Now, with your eyes closed, imagine listening to a bassist and a tuba player taking turns playing the same musical passage, right? Maybe something like this. So no matter what, it will be trivially easy for you to tell the instruments apart because the bass guitar and the tuba have radically different timbres. So their tonal unlikeness is due principally to the way each instrument produces and maintains its sound. The tuba player buzzes his or her lips into a mouthpiece while blowing down a metal pipe, and the bass player plucks a string suspended over a fingerboard. The tuba is honking and resonant, and the bass guitar is deep and mellow. Distinguishing characteristics in timbre, such as these, exist for every instrument and every voice on earth, and these details of sound are available to any careful listener who is willing to listen actively. Now jazz itself has its own timbre that is separate from what instrument is playing it. And jazz's timbre is characterized by shouts and growls and moans that are common to the jazz trumpet, saxophone, and clarinet. These unusual, sometimes ragged and snarling sounds are derived from the inflections first heard in African American work songs and field haulers. Jazz timbre seeks to simulate the human voice, specifically the blues singers and the work song singers of the late 19th century and early 20th century, the sounds that were a heavy influence on early jazz. Sometimes the snarling and unusual sounds are created using foreign objects. For example, a trumpet sometimes uses a plunger, which is a device that fits into the bell. And a guitar sometimes is played with a bottleneck for a wholly otherworldly timbre. Let's take a listen to one of the songs that's on the listening for the midterm, Snake Rag by King Oliver. If we listen to the trumpet passage coming up here, we can hear that they've been distorted by the use of a mute. Quite different than the timbre on offer in classical music, which typically seeks to be smooth and blending, where jazz seeks to be rough around the edges. Okay, let's go on to the instrumentation of jazz. Now, technically, all instruments are invited to the jazz party, but there are some that are a lot more common, right? These are the trumpet, trombone, saxophone, clarinet, piano, bass, and guitar, and the drums. These are the typical jazz instruments that we encounter. But it's not unheard of that violin will play jazz, or perhaps oboe. These instruments that aren't normally part of the jazz ensemble can technically play jazz, but they're not common. The jazz band itself is typically divided into two parts the horn section and the rhythm section. In jazz, the brass instruments like the trumpet, the trombone, and reed instruments like the clarinet and the saxophone are categorized as horns, though technically they are different instrument families. The clarinet and saxophone have a reed, and the trumpet and trombone are brass instruments. 
In any case, these instruments typically comprise the horn section, and they make the melodies, the part of the song that you can sing along to, and the counter melodies. These are the call and response textures, uh, born of singing a melody and then having part of the band reprise that melody as a call and response. The opposite part of the jazz band is the rhythm section, which is a small unit of musicians composed of piano, bass, and drums. And sometimes there's guitar. And back in the day, in New Orleans-style jazz, there would be a banjo player and a tuba instead of a guitar and a bass. So no matter its makeup, the rhythm section's job is to provide the uh, chord progression and provide the foundation for the horn section to rest its melodies upon. So let's take a look at the normal rhythm section. Here's a piano, guitar, bass, and drums. Whereas the horn section is playing melodies. So here's the basic relationship. The rhythm section provides the harmonic propulsion and percussive beats to support the melodies and counter melodies. Here's the schematic of the jazz band. We have the rhythm section here on the left, piano, bass, guitar, and drums. And then on the right we have the horn section. Down front we have the saxophones, which sometimes double on a reed instrument like a clarinet. And then in the middle we have the trombone section, and then behind the trombone section we have the trumpet section. Okay, so let's go over some of these common instruments. The most distinguished voice in jazz has to be the trumpet. It's probably the quintessential jazz instrument. It has a shrill, bright, and strident tone. And that's perfect for cutting through the sonic din of a jazz ensemble. And its brilliant timbre makes it a perfect device for communicating the idiosyncratic sounds of jazz music, the shouts and the growls and the human influence. The trumpet replaced the cornet in jazz. The, the cornet is very similar to a trumpet, though it has a slightly shorter length of tubing and a different shape bore, which is the hole that goes through the tube and it has a more mellow sound. So the modern trumpet was more suited for jazz, so into the swing era, late New Orleans style. The cornet was basically phased out and replaced by the trumpet. Another common instrument is the trombone, which is very common and easy to tell apart because it looks like plumbing with a mouthpiece. It has a slime activated length of tubing that is capable of producing uh, lower sounds than the trumpet, but it has a somewhat comical and powerful bleat that helps the jazz sound tie together. Right? You can scoot in between notes with the trombone, similar to how I can do with my slide on the guitar. Another jazz horn is the clarinet, sometimes called the licorice stick in a jazz context. And it is a woodwind instrument, so it has a slightly different timbre, a little more mellow, rich, and organic sound. And it's unmistakably separate from the shrill brightness of the brass instruments. Another common jazz horn is the saxophone, maybe as ubiquitous as the trumpet. So it has some of the woody earthiness of the clarinet, but it has a lot of the power of the brass instruments like the trumpet and its hybrid construction is responsible for this duality. Also, the saxophone appears to be uh, very fluent in its fingering, so the players can really go fast. They can fly on this instrument even faster than guitar players, so that makes listening to jazz featuring a saxophone pretty exciting. Okay, so this is the main point, though. No matter what horn they're playing, to get an authentically jazzy sound, 
they all manipulate and distort their instrument's timbres to some degree, the point being to make the melodies highly personal personalized, ragged, and lifelike. So no straightforward. It's all. Right. Every sound tries to be distinct. Okay, the guitar and the piano, part of the rhythm section, they fill similar rules in a jazz band. Uh, principally because they can play more than one note at a time. So that means that they can play chords. So they can do this thing called comping, which is short for accompanying. So short for accompanying is comping. So pianists and guitar players play constructs called chords that supports melody. And uh, another neat thing that guitar and piano can do is that they can play melodies and chords at the same time. So they are often seen in a solo jazz context. It makes more sense since they can accompany this themselves than just seeing a, a solo trumpet player, say. A solo trumpet player seems kind of naked without the rhythm section. Not so for guitar and piano. Now there are some exceptions here. I can imagine a solo jazz trumpet, but it's not common. Okay, let's go on to another part of the rhythm section, and that's the, uh, the bass and the drums. Uh, the drums and the bass of the rhythm section form a musical foundation capable of supporting the entire band. Typically, the, the bass player is keeping a steady quarter note pulse, right? That is keeping the tempo steady, and then the drum set sort of adds a, uh, like, a, like a style to it that I'm attempting to simulate with the guitar. The percussive sounds uh, make the beat explicit from the drum set. And this is another way that jazz is separate from classical music. Classical music is rhythmically felt for its beat, typically outlined by the contour of the melody. But in jazz and in pop music, the beat is explicit, and it's made via the drum set, hitting things with a stick. Now, the jazz idiom has a couple idiosyncrasies when it comes to drums and rhythm. One is the swing feel. So instead of playing the rhythm straight, uh, jazz is often swung, which uh, sort of feels like this. Separate that from straight. And another thing that happens is the drum feel is referred to as the big four because there are four steady very strongly punctuated beats per bar. Now ragtime usually had two, so it would feel something like this. One, two, three, four. So there's four, four in a ragtime feel, and we sort of have these bass lines articulating two strong beats. Whereas in jazz, if we adjust this rhythm, something like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, and that's called the big four. Here it is up the speed. It's, it usually feels something like this. That's called the Big Four, and it is a hallmark of the jazz idiom. Okay, so the synergy between the drums and the bass is the primary reason why jazz is so danceable, and perhaps the biggest reason why it was so insanely popular in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s. It was modern pop music. You could dance, there were dance crazes, and we owe it all to the drum set and the bass player. Okay, 
Let's go on to some details about uh, jazz music theory. We're not going to get too crazy with the details. This is not a music theory class, but there are a few things to pay attention to here. One is this, that the blue notes, the call and response textures, and the syncopated rhythms, the African American tradition, have been superimposed upon the instrumentation, harmonic textures, and melodic conventions of the European tradition. And that means uh, things like um, blue notes, which sort of sounds in between major and minor, and singing back and forth, and playing rhythms that are syncopated. All of the instruments just mentioned, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, clarinet, guitar, those are all European inventions and feature prominently in European music. Uh, the harmonic textures, the fact that jazz uses chords, right, and the chords support melody, that is a European invention too. That is a music theory straight out of the classical common usage period, which would have been Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. The music theory in the Western tradition works like this. Here's a highly simplified version of European Western music theory. There are 12 notes. That's it, just 12 of them. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then we get to the octave. And now if we take a subset of those 12 notes, we can derive the pitch set known as the major scale. Right? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Even non-musicians have heard that sound before. It's a collection of seven notes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and an octave. And what's neat about it is it yields near limitless melody because all seven notes essentially sound good together. So no matter what sequence a composer places them in, here I'll try to play something at random. I really try to just let go there and just play random notes of the scale. But none of them sounded bad together. So it's sort of like a word bank for music. You can pick these notes here and make your sentences. Okay, here's the next aspect. Uh, we can take some of those seven notes of the major scale and combine them to form three note clusters known as chords. So if we take three notes in that scale and we stack them on top of each other, right? We get these uh, little constructs called chords. Uh, chords are known as harmonies and they produce the perfect superstructure to support melody. Okay, let me improvise something here. So let's play some chords. Oh. Uh, music in the Western tradition is comprised of a sequence of notes that comprise a melody. Right, you can sing Happy Birthday. That's a melody. And uh, the note sequences are supported by note clusters that we refer to as harmony. Right? There's a big cluster of notes, and that's a harmony supporting that high note, which is the melody. Okay, so jazz plays this exact same musical game. There's no difference. Its primary difference is that it's inflected with blue notes, call and response textures, and syncopated rhythms. And the instruments themselves are purposefully distorted, right? trying to manipulate the instrument's natural sound. And that's it. That is the primary thing that jazz has to offer. Okay, uh, one more quick thing about blue notes, just in case that doesn't mean anything to you. In music theory, in the Western tradition, we essentially have two modalities. <laughs> major modality and we have a minor modality right one sort of sounds happy and one sort of sounds sad well blues and jazz 
uh, don't play that game exactly, oftentimes they will blend the two modes using a blue note, which is somewhere in between major and minor. Right? Some, sometimes it's realized by shaking or bending or otherwise smearing the note into the other to create a musical double entendre. Let me explain with the chord here. So here's a major chord, and here's a minor chord, and here's a melody that's major, right? and here's a melody that's minor. But blues, I'll use my slide here, sort of glides in between. All right? So it makes it somewhat destabilizing to listen to. The listener isn't sure if the music is happy or sad. For those musically literate, here's the, uh, the blue note in a C7 chord. There's a C7. And then uh, the blues note here is... Right? Little blues notes that are smeared and designed to sound destabilizing. Okay, here's the conclusion. Jazz players use European instruments to simulate African vocal timbres within a musical idiom that is mostly, but not entirely, based on Western conventions of harmony and melody. Okay, thanks class. I hope that you got something from that. Till next time.